and welcome back to the Warwick F1 show. Today we are talking about the Japanese Grand Prix that took place a few weeks ago. Max Verstappen returning to the top of the podium after his DNF in Australia. Uh, 26 points, fastest lap as well, very not really challenged and I think what a lot of people were expecting from the race. Sergio Perez uh, getting his uh, the second or second or third one two finish for Red Bull this season, and then Carlos Sainz after his win in Australia, putting in another solid performance, coming in third and obviously boosting his stock for his drive or for a potential drive next season. Behind him we had Charles Leclerc, Lando Norris, and Alonso. The Mercedes were struggling down in the lower ends of the points. Yuki Tsunoda getting his first points in Japan, the first points for a Japanese driver in Japan since Kamui Kobayashi back in 2012. And then on the flip side, we did have Danny Rick and Alex Albon crashing at the start and with questions, I think, mounting over whether Daniel Ricciardo might get replaced. Obviously, it's not the best thing for him. Um, I'm today joined by Callum and Will. And I guess as ever, we'll start off Callum with uh, the rating out of 10, what, what what would you give that? Uh, I'd say that's probably, compared to compared to the previous three races we've had, um, especially Australia, it, um, it certainly did feel more like a procession compared to some of the other ones. So I'd say I'd, I, I'd even go far to say six, maybe even a five. Um, we'll, we'll be optimistic and say a six, but yeah, it wasn't, uh, it's, there wasn't really many kind of standout events, I guess you could say, to talk about um, once the once the race had finished, and again, certainly what we were expecting in terms of the results. So, I'd I'd go ahead and give it a six. See, I'm going to kind of go in the opposite direction. I'm going to go with like an eight. I thought compared to what we've had this year, it's the first race we've had multiple strategies. You've had multiple kind of, uh, well, yeah, well, I suppose yeah, strategies kind of playing out with different teams, even within the same team. If you look at Ferrari, like you've got that kind of contrast. You didn't. Like you always had an idea that the two stop was going to be the better strategy, but even Mercedes did like a different version of it. That was, I mean, summing up Mercedes season, they did the better strategy and still managed to make it look bad. But I think it was, it was a, there was always some intrigue going on. There was always overtaking, especially considering previous years in Japan when it's been dry, we've not seen a lot of overtaking. I think we saw quite a lot, especially even compared to Australia that we, we thought was a great, uh, well, I say a great race. It was like a good race, whereas I think this was much more entertaining and definitely much wor- much more worth waking up early in the morning for than Australia was, even as a Ferrari fan. I, I, I suppose, I guess, I, I, I do I do understand what you're saying because I think definitely what the race had going for it was those multiple different strategies. And so you had, we, we definitely had a, a lot more chaos in terms of in terms of pit lane action and and seeing the 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 the, the pecking order mix mix up quite a bit more um it's just a shame that they didn't have um and anything else uh that that possibly australia did have and and again it was more of what we we're expecting um compared to compared to maybe australia but but certainly it's um it, it did feel very i agree with you there that it felt felt very refreshing to see lots of different strategies play out and see how they could compete against each other for sure yeah, I mean, I think that's what I'm kind of thinking. I'd probably give it about a five. Um, yeah, five or six, probably leaning towards that five. And I think it is just because while there were those strategies, everything kind of shuffled out as we were expecting it to. The Red Bulls ended up one and two. The Ferraris were P3 and P4. You do have a bit of competition maybe between the McLarens, um, Fernando Alonso and the Mercedes perhaps down the lower end. But while there were these strategies what we like to see i guess is these strategies ending up paying off but everyone kind of did different things but it ended up kind of ending in the same way so it almost felt like we kind of had all this promise but it ended up like as as we were kind of expecting it to but i mean i think one thing people weren't expecting at the start maybe we were expecting some chaos but maybe not between alex albon and Daniel Ricciardo album um, back in his own car after taking Logan Sargent in Australia. Daniel Ricciardo coming under pressure um, after his results from the start of the season. And I don't think 
it was the it was obviously it wasn't the I desired outcome for the drivers to end up in the gravel at a uh, turn I think turn three was it? Uh, yeah, I think it was like maybe I think it was turn two potentially. It's like the worst case scenario for both of them. You think from Danny Rick's perspective, his teammates had a great start to the season. He's just scored points. I think in back to back races, I want to say, having like a lot of fun, really enjoying himself. And we're starting to see like the best of Yuki Tsunoda almost. And he's going to basically cut across someone very, it it almost took me back to that kind of infamous Bahrain fireball crash where I can't remember who it was. that just kind of cut across the front of Grosjean and kind of sent him out to the side. But it 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 was very similar to that, that you had Albon kind of just stranded on the outside as Danny Rick swings across. And then from Albon's perspective, you've got Williams that have had, no chassis left basically (laughs) and what is a quick turnaround in in some senses of two weeks isn't ideal so losing another chassis potentially straight after they just lost one in australia is not what that team needed on long haul flights away from their uk base did they actually did they actually do you know if they if they deduced it as a racing incident the the event between Ricardo and Albon because I thought it was kind of more along the lines of that and if so even though I, I suppose even though obviously there's more pressure mounting under Ricardo um, it's maybe not necessarily all of his fault of the events that transpired it just happens that this has come after all of all of his results that we've seen previously and com- compiled with that and also the the completely opposite amazing performance that we've seen as you said from his teammate Yuki Tsunoda and that's kind of mounting for it but um but yeah did they actually did they actually end up having it as a racing incident or Ricardo as well I mean they didn't give out any penalties so yeah I I think it even like to me it was a racing incident but I think just because it was so busy he was more concerned about I think it was one of the hasses on the inside of him um that he was trying to make sure that he didn't go into that that he kind of gave it more room than he maybe should have and didn't really really realize that Albon was on his outside, so it's it was a racing incident, but it, it kind of just reminded me of that incident in Bahrain. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a kind of a very typical racing incident. You're looking at the start of the race; everyone's jostling for position, kind of trying to find that space, and it just like Ricardo sees the Haas moves across, and he just doesn't realize that um Albon's on on his right I think probably ends up might have even been in his blind spot because those mirrors aren't exactly kind of the largest but I think the issue Danny Rick's having is that his teammate has had such a good start to the season and when realistically he is in the team he's not a young driver he's in his mid he's in his like early to mid 30s he's kind of that insurance policy if in the event of let's say Sergio Perez having some absolute shockers, there's that's the insurance policy that they can push Danny Rick up for a season and then see see how he goes in that car. But if he's not performing, his teammates doing better, and realistically, our uh, RB have another really talented driver waiting in the wings in Liam Lawson. There isn't much point in Ricardo being in that seat, and I think if this continues. Maybe if it was another team, I wouldn't say this. But if this continues, I could genuinely, I could very easily see kind of Daniel, Daniel Ricciardo dropping out of F1 and his seat going to going to Liam Lawson. I mean, it's, it's certainly much of a surprise just how how opposite the performance of performances have been between the two drivers from the start of the season. And you probably thought that when Ricardo did come in um, halfway through, through last season, it was almost, he might've come in to, to show a bit of maturity and a bit of experience and, and give that to his, his younger team at Yuki Sonoda. And now we're seeing the complete opposite in a way in that Sonoda is consistently miles better performance wise and getting the most out of that car um, compared to Ricardo, and what's even worrying for Ricardo, I think, at this point in time, is that Sonoda is showing that, possibly unlike the cars from cars from AlphaTauri in the past, it has the potential to score points on on a lot of different circuits, and and as a result, Sonoda has done, and so 
maybe because the car has that potential, which Ricardo really isn't getting any out of, then you can maybe start to feel that Alfa Tauri might be getting more desperate to get him out of that seat because they know that they're missing out on these vital opportunities per race to, to score points and get them up in the Constructors' Championship. So you have to feel at the moment, unless you know Ricardo is really on the last resort at the moment, if he can't get those performances in the next couple of races, which which justifies him that seat, then you've, you've got to start thinking that, that the team's going to be getting impatient, especially, especially a team that we know is connected to Red Bull, who we know are historically very impatient when it comes to drivers. Um, and yeah, it's the amount of pressure that he must be under at the moment is is incredible as a result. Yeah, and I think almost, you could almost say that maybe Yuki Tsunoda at the moment is helping Daniel Ricciardo because Ricciardo not scoring points isn't having as much of a detrimental effect because realistically they're not going to be challenging Aston Martin. Their, bat- their battle was with Haas, with Sauber, with Williams and if if Alpine decide to improve with Alpine as well for that sixth place in the championship. But if any of those teams start to improve, if we do see maybe Sauber sort out their pit stop issues, if we see Haas kind of get those one or two points that they seem to be getting on a consistent basis and the gap starts to close to um, RB from Haas, then then Ricardo is in trouble because that is that that's the big thing. And so on some occasions, teams lose positions in the constructors championship because one driver isn't performing. And when the margins are so tiny in this season, especially because we've got five five teams that should maybe be crowding out those ten points positions, one or two points matters. And if Ricardo is never getting them, and Liam Lawson can, then RB or the kind of Red Bull outfit are going to look towards the future a bit more and say if Liam Lawson or if Ricardo can't get points and Liam Lawson might get points and Liam Lawson's younger and we can use him to evaluate whether maybe Sonoda or Lawson goes into that Red Bull seat then why why would they not take that risk? I think another worrying thing as well is it's it's not just it, he's I think certainly Ricardo has had enough opportunities to be able to score those points in races it's certainly not an opportunity it's certainly not a case of being unlucky in certain races and all right yes he was involved in a racing incident this time but he there's certainly been multiple races that he's finished he's finished and he's had enough time on track with different strategies for us to observe his pace and the the reality is is that compared to his teammate his pace in that car is is shocking it, he really hasn't connected with that car in the same way that Yuki Tsunoda has a bit like what we saw from him often at uh, at McLaren. And so definitely, I think it, if I, I hate to be talking about it this early on the season, but if, if he were to get replaced possibly halfway through, like we've seen from uh, other kind of like the other Red Bull drivers that we've seen in the, in the past, um, obviously not for, for um, well, actually for Nick De Vries, actually um, uh, when Ricardo came in that kind of suddenly, um, it it honestly wouldn't surprise me, and I don't think really anyone would would blame them for that as such because the the performances have been that bad, and I think it wouldn't really surprise anyone uh, at this point if 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 he was to go relatively soon. Yeah, and I mean it wasn't just Ricardo kind of struggling on the or on the on the side of having downturns. I think for me, this race now has really cemented the fact that Mercedes have made a car that isn't very good. Like, we look to the W13 in 22 and the W14 last year, and you'd say that they, they were below Mercedes standards um, in terms of, obviously, they weren't able to fight for those wins, but they were able to get podiums on a fairly, fairly consistent basis when the drivers were able able to perform but this year it it may it may not be that the car's bad it may be the, that everyone else has improved but the w15 isn't doing anything like there's seemingly no kind of tracks that it works on it's unable to compete with obviously, obviously the red bulls but also the ferraris also to a certain extent at some tracks fernando alonso and the aston martin um can't compete with norris and 
it is now at the bottom bottom kind of end of those points. So what what do Mercedes do now? Yeah, it's it's a bit of a funny one. I think even if you look at like the last two years, like you said, like they weren't great cars, but they were the best Mercedes powered car. Like last year that like Aston Martin were obviously ahead of them, but they they kind of had to reset their whole kind of uh philosophy of what their car was but by the end of the season they were comfortably that kind of best um well i suppose mclaren even overtook them then but i think it's they need to figure out what their competitors are doing that they're not and kind of i think they they've almost been a victim of their own success and that they were so clear for so long they didn't have to worry about how good their developments and upgrades were like they would just turn up at the start of the season with a car that was good when they could spend as much money on it as they wanted to. But now there's a cost cap and they're kind of limited. They're not very good at kind of putting those resources where it needs to go. And they, they've they not really had to do that at any point. So now they're having to learn to do it. And it's, it's doing kind of poor management, I think, and poor kind of development. And they're losing a lot of staff members. And I think it's not a great place to be at the moment as a staff member or as a driver. Yeah, and I think the the how this is maybe compared i'd say to to previous seasons is obviously uh, as as you mentioned they we 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 have no doubt that the capabilities that that team has of 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 winning races and and dominating over the field and and producing a good car that like in the same way that red bull has been this season just completely dominates over the field but for the past two seasons i'm not sure about anyone else but personally for me when i saw mercedes in that position you kind of you remembered how they were for that the previous period before the the upgrades came in and the thinking yeah this is mercedes at the moment but surely they they they'll get back towards the front of the field at some point maybe just give them a couple of years and they'll be right back up there with red bull but it's almost getting to a point now where probably quite worryingly for as you mentioned toto wolf and for the rest of their staff that you're almost getting used to being in this sort of fourth slash fifth place position which really is not where you want, want to be obviously for a team like Mercedes and we, we've already seen Hamilton lose faith in the team clearly that's that's why I think he's going to Mercedes because he, he realizes that the, the team doesn't have much of a chance to to get anywhere near winning races or, or maybe even um, consistent podiums in the next couple of years and it, it's just a shame to see Mercedes kind of having got used to that over the, the past couple of seasons and not really getting anywhere going backwards, if anything, I'd say. Well, yeah, I mean, it also just doesn't look like they know what is going on with the car. Like the the wind tunnel and the aero simulations are sending them out such different results. And you've, see, you've seen it at multiple races now. Lewis Hamilton in a practice session has gone, oh, that was a really good practice session. Car felt really good, able to put in good times making some progress but then come quali or the next practice session it the car is suddenly a completely different animal and it seems seems to be i I feel like i've read like it seems to be on temperature even like a five degree difference will have such a such a massive effect on the car and it really just doesn't look like they know what is going on what they're doing and i think toto after after the race said um the season's over and when you're four races in to a season, it does just look like giving up. And I'm not sure it's the it's the best look from from him from the the team is that they have just given up because even when I don't know even when Ferrari were struggling more, even when like McLaren or Aston Martin were struggling more, you always kind of had that sense that they were they were still trying, but. With Mercedes, it doesn't look like, at least to me, it doesn't look like they know what to do, how to do it, where to do it, or that they even maybe want to do it. They seem, as Callum said, they seem content with where they are at the moment. Yeah, they remind me a little bit of Ferrari last year, where like the car was so kind of on a knife edge that if they get it right, then it, I'm sure they'll turn up to one weekend and they'll be on one of the sessions, it'll be in that perfect kind of window and they'll put in a great lap and they'll put in like this amazing kind of performance. But I think they're even in a worse position than Fry that they're kind of, they just don't know. Like Fry knew that their car was 
was tricky and w- were making the best out of situations when they probably shouldn't have been. Like we look at Singapore, for example, they probably weren't the best in terms of time management there, but they still managed to get the win. Whereas Toto Wolf, I think, is kind of showing his true colours as kind of a manager that if he's not winning, he's, he, he doesn't really care, which is such a bad thing to have because he, he's not involved in the technical side. He He's there for the business kind of about making money, making winning trophies. And it's just such a bad look for the team that, like you said, if he's just kind of saying, oh, it's kind of done for the season. No, but you've got to make sure that you're getting better because there's no point wasting a season of potential development when you've only got one year left of these regs anyway, so you may as well make the most of it. I'm not exactly sure I, I write Mercedes off completely yet. I mean, it certainly looks like a very dire situation, but we, we've certainly had other teams that have shown especially around that midfield area that you just have one development that that can that can really push you over the edge of the field I'm thinking maybe McLaren last year or, or aspects like that but but like you said it's 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 worrying when it it looks like there's you, you don't feel like there's a hundred percent going into that car and especially when again they've had such a strong driver lineup you could argue maybe one of the 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 best on the on the entire grid and it, it's just a shame that their that their car is not performing and if that is the case that that they maybe aren't pushing as much as other teams and aren't as used to being in that position probably as you say as a result of being as the the dominant car for so long then it, it is definitely worrying for the team and how they could potentially slip back even further. I think they need to kind of grasp it at this moment or else they 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 risk losing even more than they have at the moment. Yeah, but a driver that's been grasping it, kind of his opportunities for the last few races obviously doesn't have a drive for 2025 is Carlos Sainz. Um, after his win, uh, Australia coming back from uh, appendicitis that took him out of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, He's followed that up with a third place performance, beating his teammate Charles Leclerc. And I don't I think it's fair to say that when we saw that he would be out on um or for Saudi Arabia, I don't think anyone would have said, Oh, he's gonna get a podium at the next two races and win one. And he honestly, it, well, he's doing everything he can to boost his boost his kind of reputation for to get a drive next season and on on this form any team would would want to have him yeah for sure i think i i'm a massive believer in carlos i think he's one of the best drivers on the grid i think we mentioned mercedes is great lineup but i think ferrari have by far the best lineup at the moment but kind of going like don't get me wrong carlos has had an amazing kind of performances especially since he's come back I, I still think Leclerc has been equally at the same level. I just don't think we've had the chance to see it. I think he's been almost the opposite of what he's been in previous years, where his kind of qualifying pace has put him right up the front and then his race pace has just trailed off and his tyre management wasn't great. And then, whereas if we look back at this kind of race we've just seen, is he's just put in this ma- m- mammoth stint from on one set of tyres that's outlasted basically everyone else. I managed to gain three positions and as a, like as the result. And it's I think had he been up near the front, he definitely would have been giving Carlos a good run for his money and could have probably shown that actually with those fresher tires he would have had a good run on him. If they'd each had like started like third and fourth on the grid, I think it would have been much closer. It's just that kind of Saturday performance. And again, kind of thinking back to Australia, I think I think it would have been interesting to see a good fight for the lead had he been allowed to. But I think his tyres were kind of compromised by being told to sit behind Carlos. But yeah, I think Carlos has had an amazing kind of return and to get those back-to-back podiums is super impressive and to kind of show kind of the commitment and the fitness as well after coming back from surgery is just super impressive. So hopefully we find out pretty soon if he's got a drive. And I think the favourite at the moment is probably Red Bull. I certainly don't believe for a second that He's he's not going to be on the grid for next year. Um, I I can't imagine that any any team wouldn't want to take him him up. I think really now for for science with the performances that he's put in, it's more a case of of what team he's going to go to. Whether rather than just is there going to be a team available? Obviously, we know there's a there's a spare seat at Mercedes, but you, again, as we've talked about, their kind of lack of pace in the car, you'd worry if if that was a 
potentially a a possible downgrade from Ferrari, although I guess you can't really go uh, much further than than the pace that Ferrari have at the moment. But and and I do feel that, like you said, with Red Bull, even though Perez has possibly performed better than he has compared to last year and maybe even other previous years as well in that Red Bull seat, you'd think that that Red Bull would certainly be uh, would consider offering him a seat if if science would want to go to Red Bull, and so. I, I think it's for certain because just purely from the performances that he's put in, like we've said, and the, and the commitment that he shows to that, to to every single race, it's I I am sure for certain that that we'll we'll see him in one of the top teams for for next season. Yeah, I mean, I'd be really surprised if he didn't have a seat, even of obviously Red Bull uh, mentioned as a big or kind of a big option. I think it very much depends on kind of how Sergio Perez does for the rest of the season. Obviously, he did start well last season and then did tail off a little bit. Time will probably tell if that takes place this season as well. I think um, Salba was another name that was mentioned. Um, obviously, they are transitioning into Audi in the next two years. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you, you want to have him because... At the end of the day, and I know situations kind of matter and, and everyone kind of ends up where they are, but in the last in the last now year, he is the only other driver, apart from Max Verstappen, to have won a race. And at the end of the day, you had you have to be in those situations, but you also have to succeed in them. And when science has been there, he's managed to do so and show the racecraft as well, show the speed when necessary and I think like like we've all saying and I think it's the consensus is that he deserves that seat in a top team and he I mean he wouldn't be leaving Ferrari unless um Lewis Hamilton was kind of coming into the into the team but I think he'll he'll end up somewhere at least I hope so because it would be really really unfair kind of if he didn't it it, it almost reminds me quite similarly of when on Perez's final season um, with, was it Racing Point at that point? Um, where I think it was when he won, I can't remember what year, it was maybe 2022 or something around then. Um, when he won the, I remember. It was the year yeah. before the big Lewis Max strong. Yes, yeah, that was right. Sorry, yeah, too late. But um, but yeah, when he won in, um, won in Bahrain, I think, and it was just, you, you just get the feeling at the end, you just think, is this really a driver that we're, we're going to lose. Surely we can't lose some someone of 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 this caliber of um, f- from the sport. And you do f- quite feel sorry for Science because he's always been that driver. Unfortunately, throughout his career, that's been that's that's been ditched over someone else. Obviously, Red Bull uh, picked Verstappen over him from their lineup at Toro Rosso. Then he obviously had to go from Renault. And also from McLaren when Ricardo came in, and and now the exact same situation is is happening again. And I I feel he's very underrated from a lot of teams that he goes for. Um, that uh, sorry that he's at, and 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 definitely feel that he should get more of a look in, and 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 certainly deserves a, a seat for for next season as we as we mentioned for sure. Yeah, that's kind of bringing us to the end of the review. Obviously, we'll move on to our predictions in a second. Um, is there is there anything anyone wants to add? Any kind of performances maybe we haven't highlighted? I think for me, uh, the one the ones we maybe the one we haven't spoken about as much is that Yuki Sonoda point. Um, obviously, at a home race, it's really nice to kind of get points, and obviously. When we're talking about comparison to Daniel Ricciardo, it is the best thing he can do, and it sets him up potentially for that Red Bull seat. But, I mean, I don't know about you guys. Have you got any other drivers that we haven't mentioned that you want to highlight quickly? Yeah, just a quick one on Oscar Piastri. Like obviously, we said at the start of the season that we were really looking forward to seeing how he does in his second year. But he's he's kind of struggled a little bit. Obviously, he had the great drive in Saudi Arabia to pick up. P4 and again in Australia, but he was quite off the pace of his teammate in Australia. And I think the safety car helped him in Saudi. So I think it'll be interesting to see how he does, especially kind of in China, which is a new track and kind of some of these other ones where he's not got all of that kind of youth experience because he needs to start kind of 
getting closer to Lando in these races, not just the ones where he's raced up before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but on that on that note, it's it's quite interesting with Piastri um, being in the team, and obviously when he wasn't performing last season, that's when both drivers weren't performing because of the lack of pace in the car, and and really since then, when the when the pace did come in the car, he he really performed and showed his skill set. But this is the first time that he's he's hit a little bit of bad form and it's it's I think it's gonna be the first proper test he has mentality wise in F1 of how can he kind of just get through this this bad period and get back to the 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 skill set and the driver that we that we know he he can be from his performances last year at the at the second half of the season. Yeah. No I think I think that's fair. I think very much depends on kind of how he can do but I think we should. We've got faith in faith in Oscar Piastri. We've seen him perform last year, and he should be able to get back on track this year as well. Right. So, like I said, we'll move on now to our predictions from the Japanese Grand Prix. Uh, I'm looking at mine now, and I've I've had a bit of a stinker. I'm not going to lie. I don't I don't know about you guys. How are you looking? No, I'm just really glad I had Verstappen as as first place. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. that's got my only saving grace. Unbelievable. I'm, one, I'm, ne- I'm never going to get over it. I think Chimmy Chimmy's not looking too bad as I'm looking at his predictions now. But um, yeah, just kind of a average weekend. Nothing, nothing too good, but not not awful, I'd say. All right. Um, I mean, the score is currently um, Will and Chimmy are on 18. Uh, I'm on 16. Uh, so just well, quite close so far, just a few points in it. I'll run through mine first. So I went for a top five of Leclerc, Sainz, Verstappen, Norris and Piastri. So that is, as far as I'm aware, four points because um, each of my first four drivers, Leclerc, Sainz, Verstappen, Norris, were in the top five. But unfortunately, none of them were in the correct position. So four points from there. Um, my one, two, and three point predictions. I'll go. I'll go from the top. Actually, um, I went for a double McLaren podium. Obviously, double Red Bull podium. So that didn't happen. Verstappen Grand Slam. I think Norris led a few laps, as far as I can remember. Yes. Yeah. He yeah. Did. So unfortunately, not that one. And then uh, my one pointer was a cool fan hat. And I think there was that hat. There was the Red Bull hat. So went into they the... put the camera on him and it went into the Aston Martin one. And I think that yeah, should we'll, count. We'll, we'll give you that one. All right. So that's one point for my one, two, and three. So I ended up on five. How did you do, Will? Um, not much better. <laughs> so I had Verstappen <laughs> first. It was like, great. Leclerc, Norris, Saint Piastri. So again, got four of them, but I had Verstappen in the right place. So that's six. Yeah. Uh, I'll go from most from three down to one, like you. And my so my three pointer was Merc driver calls another car a rocket ship, which I don't think happened. I don't think there was I, any kind of similar kind of comment about. I mean, if there was going to be one, it would have been like Perez on Hamilton at one thirty R. To be fair to him, didn't mention that. That was a good move. There was some cracking overtakes. I'll get to that in a second, actually. All right. Um, my two point predictions was that both Alpines were in Q two, which didn't, didn't happen. No. Um. And then my one pointer was that um, the driver who gets pole doesn't win. And I thought Perez was so close to getting it. He was. But right above that, I crossed out that I've got two plus moves at 130. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Great. That's quite ironic because it is 130. Oh, you could have got that. Yeah. Sorry, that was awful. Um, yeah, that was not, not your finest. I'm just, just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just so realizing I... now, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'd say that your three-point prediction is actually more likely than your two-point prediction, given how much yeah, you say more than, more than rocket than two, ships yeah. and Alpine is struggling so much. But <laughs> I guess I guess yeah. I wasn't around to, to question that. But yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. So um, is that six points for you? Yeah, just the six. Fair play. And Callum, uh, stubbing in for Chimay, what are we what are we saying? Yeah, so Chimay didn't do too bad as far as I can tell. Um, so. His order for the top five. So he had Perez first, and obviously he gave him second. So that's one in the top five. Uh, Norris also in the top five. He put him second. Uh, Science he got correct with P3. He put Science as third. 
and uh, Piastri, he unfortunately put as P4, but then he obviously finished P8, so outside the top five. Uh, but then the Leclerc also, he put P5, and the Leclerc obviously finished uh, P4. So that is uh, one, six, two, six, six, six points for the, yeah, so six points for the top five. And then for his three-pointer, he put at least four Ferrari-engined cars in the points. And am I correct in saying it was only the just the two Ferraris? Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's correct. Um, his two pointer was Verstappen on pole by at least two tenths, and he only was less than a tenth behind uh, Checo. And then the safety car, he said for a one pointer, a safety car in the race. And am I correct in saying that didn't happen either? Because the incident at the start led to a red flag. Yeah. And <laughs> so he actually he actually missed out on the one point prediction as well. So yeah. Um and obviously there was a standing start after that, so they didn't um didn't go back under safety car either. So I think Jim may misses out on all of his predictions, yeah, unfortunately, absolutely. for, yeah, for this week. So six points. Week. Yeah. Yep, so six points. So that has left the standings um will and Shime, identical weeks um taking up them up to 24 points i was um i didn't get any perfect but i did get my one point to make a five point week so i'm on 21 now so fallen fallen behind a bit but i'm sure it's we'll fine. be able Three points to is just one drive in the right place that's fine yeah exactly sure we'll be able to catch up right that has brought us to the end of this review any final words from you guys no great yeah so thank you for, or, so that is yeah brought us to the end and uh thank you for listening <laughs>